Over the last year in particular, we've seen a number of people challenge the idea that you can still be a nomad capitalist, that you can still go where you're treated best. People say there's nowhere left to run. You'll have nowhere in which to flee. Well, today I'm gonna to share with you my perspective of exactly why I think being a nomad capitalist and applying the things we talk about is even more important today after all the chaos in the world than it ever was before. Hi, I'm Andrew Henderson, I'm the author of this book. And here at Nomad Capitalist, our team of well over 40 people, our network of global experts, and yours truly help seven and eight figure entrepreneurs and investors legally go where they're treated best. You can learn more at nomadcapitalist.com. So let's talk about this. There's a great divide out there that I wanna talk about uh, with you today, which is there are people on my side who say, yeah, you've gotta look for greener pastures. You've gotta go where you're treated best. Uh, look for the places that will tax you less. Look for the places that are not talking about raising their taxes right now, uh, using the events of, of the last year as an excuse. Uh, go to those places where you can have more freedom. Uh, and then there are other people on the other side that say, there's nowhere to go. You can't always be running and hiding. You'll be running your entire life. And you know, we got a good comment from one of our uh, loyal fans who said, this is why it's dumb to claim there's a global elite who controls the world and nowhere to hide because they will catch you. There are plenty of places to live a peaceful, sovereign, low-tax life. That's how I, I feel. Now, I've been an entrepreneur my entire life. I've wanted to be in business and have you know, gone around selling stuff door-to-door -door since I was uh, 12 years old and even younger in some cases. That's the perspective of which I see this. I am a, a relatively pragmatic entrepreneur. You're certainly entitled to your own view, but from my view, uh, you don't give up. You don't throw your hands up in the air and say there's nothing that can be done. In fact, you know, for me, if there's one thing that I've taken culturally from the West, it's perhaps that very thought. You go around the world to a lot of places and one of the things that holds some of these cultures back despite having so much intelligence, so much raw potential, so much going for them, is a defeatist mindset. Uh, you can't get ahead. People sit around a cafe smoking. There's no good jobs. What can you do? You know, to me, it's never how I'm going to think. Um, this idea that you know, every country is on the same script now. You know, here's what I see. I see people, for example, in my native country, the United States, who, uh, when they travel, they go to the UK, to Ireland, to Italy, maybe they go to Australia. When they consider moving overseas, they look, what's the biggest thing I hear, perhaps? Language barrier, people concerned about language barrier. I understand that. I think you can get over it. I think more people speak English than you think they do, but People say language barrier, and then they greatly limit their options to where when they go overseas and they explore going overseas, they look at places that are really not that much different than the United States or whatever country they're from, and they see some of the same criteria. I think people also look at things through the lens of their own country in terms of how are things enforced. And so I give the example of when I was in Turkey a couple months ago with one of our, our strategy team members, and we were going around, and we said, oh, there's going to be a lock oh, Dios mio, there's going to be a lockdown uh, all weekend long. What's, what can be done? How are we gonna go and get any work done? We're gonna get in on a Friday night, get some things done, and then be stuck sitting around all weekend long. Except what we found out from one of our uh, suppliers there was, oh, you know, if you're not a citizen, people are just walking around, you know, there'll be a few police, show them your foreign passport, you keep hanging out. Even some of the locals we saw out, we saw people cooking hamburgers in the street, we are buying stuff, <laughs> walked around for half the day. And so you go to Italy, you go to Spain, you go to New Zealand, your Canada, or any of these places where they've had real totalitarian lockdowns, and that's a very different story. The words have a different meaning. The enforcement is different. And I think if you come from the United States uh, or a country like it, a legacy brand country, certainly uh, you're going to be in good shape in the sense that you're not going to mess around with the tax man anywhere else because you know just how aggressive the tax man is in your country. Uh, but I think that the challenge is you're going to see that there are areas where other countries have soft freedoms, as I call them, where you can't possibly imagine because you just haven't been there. And I'm not blaming you about that, but no doubt we have seen some countries show their true colors. I also think that there are a lot of people sitting on the sidelines right now who don't have their residence permits, don't have their passports, don't have their ticket to go anywhere else. Something I've been talking to you about getting since 2012. All right. I've been here at nomadcapitalist.com for almost a decade now, telling you this is what you need to do. And every year people start to get a little bit more, but you know what we do? We all like to wait until the last minute. 
We all like to wait until things get bad enough. And now that things are potentially bad enough, not only are many people saying, eh, they're still not bad enough. So Malaysia comes to mind. I've talked about Malaysia for many years. I have a home, actually two homes now in Malaysia. And I can go back to Malaysia anytime I want, partially because I don't use a U.S. passport to travel to Malaysia. The U.S. was on their naughty list, for example, one of about 23 countries. I can go back to Malaysia when I want. Now, people have said, uh, I saw, oh, well, Malaysia hasn't opened its borders. I guess we know their true colors. No, I don't think that anyone ever thought Asia was not what it is, which is you have this kind of benevolent king mindset, which I happen to kind of like. You see what happens when democracy runs amok uh, in some of these Western countries where people just vote themselves into endless free stuff. Um, but in Asia, it is, listen, we know what we're doing. You know, countries like South Korea, for example, some countries in Southeast Asia, here's what we're going to do. We're going to have these measures. By the way, what I can tell you is, friends of mine in Thailand, for example, they were back to living life pretty quickly uh, in 2020. I was in Malaysia and after six weeks of, of it not being that comfortable. Uh, even then, by the way, they didn't really bother you. It wasn't like people were out beating you with a stick when you went to the grocery store. Uh, but it was very comfortable. And uh, even after that, you know, we got back to life, uh, normal life, relatively quickly. Um, obviously, some countries have kind of ebbed and flowed over the last year. But I don't think anyone ever thought that Asia was this bastion of individualism. What I think Asia is is a place where people largely respect others' choices. They leave you alone on a day-to-day -day basis. No one wants to bother you. People are nice. It is certainly not, in many places, the United States. And so if your goal is just to defy in, 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 you know, every uh, edict, I hear you. Uh, I'm all for personal freedom. But you know, I think that the results that many places in Asia got uh, were better. And so if that's not what you're looking for, don't go to Asia. You know, I have a number of people now asking about going to Eastern Europe, going to Latin America. So I don't think that Malaysia or Asia showed its true colors. I think you already probably could have predicted what Asia would have done in a situation like this uh, versus places in Eastern Europe. But I think the beauty is you get to choose. Um, and so my point is, you know, I've had this infrastructure set up where I have residences and citizenships in numerous places, and I've been able to travel very freely over the course of the last year. Uh, very little hassle. Certainly there's a little bit of stress because you do absorb everyone talking and kvetching about everything and, and all the, the media and all that. Um, but by and large, I've had really no problems traveling between places where I have the right to be. And because I've chosen places that are, that are pretty uh, open. Now, I mention that to you because you could be getting into Malaysia too. If you had followed my advice, had more than one citizenship, and had set up your residence permit, um, so I'm not here to defend any particular country, but what I am here to say is you can't keep waiting until the end of time and then saying, oh, I don't know, I don't have any options. You know who does that? Losers. People who give up. Not business people, not investors, not people who are successful. So my advice to you is take this as an opportunity to understand that there are places out there where the culture wants more personal freedom. The culture is people are sick and tired of being told what to do. The culture is they've seen what doesn't work, uh, whether it's through communism or anything else in their lifetime, and now they're going to push back against it. And you know what I see is you'll see some news story about something that happened in Hong Kong or in Serbia or wherever about you know three people getting arrested at a restaurant or something. Oh, I guess what Andrew said isn't correct anymore. Three people get arrested. The whole place is written off. Meanwhile, I'm, sh I'm sitting here as a guy who might have 1% of my net worth invested in that country, and I spend two weeks in that country. I'm not naming any particular country, but I'm globally diversified. If one country were to fall apart, then I guess I would write that country off. What most people who are saying that to me are doing, though, is that's their excuse. Oh, I saw something terrible happen. You know, there's a protest and, and a guy got beaten, so I can't go there anymore. You know, if you want to find an excuse not to leave, you'll find an excuse where I come from and where many of you come from in the United States, you can turn on the news every freaking day. It doesn't even make the news anymore because someone's house gets broken into with a no-knock warrant. They throw the stun, you know, the, the, the grenade through the, uh, the window, the dog dies. I mean, look at all the stories just in the last year. Sad, sad stories. Look at all the stories of people who have had their life savings taken because what kind of person running a burrito shop should have cash? It doesn't even make the news anymore. But you know what does make the news in your country? Stories of everywhere else. 
I woke up one Saturday morning a couple months ago to find out I was on Russian television and they were playing uh, clips of my video where I announced how I'd given up U.S. citizenship. And the story was about how Americans are all giving up their citizenship and moving to Russia because Russia is so much better. That's what makes the news in Russia. You think the news in the U.S. or where you live is any different or any better? No. Stories about how terrible it is in Hong Kong make the news or how terrible it is anywhere else. And then you call people you know in Hong Kong and they're like, what are you talking about? Everything's fine. Of course the world has problems. Of course there are places that ebb and flow. But what I do think is the world is largely cyclical. And I've said for years, I look at the U.S. and other legacy brand countries as perhaps a dated reference now. Perhaps now that she's getting into things like cryptocurrency, maybe, maybe not as good a reference. But, uh, you know, 10 years ago, the U.S. I would call the Paris Hilton of countries. Someone was the third or fourth or fifth generation removed from greatness. By that point, they forgot how it was developed. And they just had the sense of entitlement that made sure that they did stupid things that didn't keep the success going. That is the West. That is legacy brand countries. And you have countries where they failed a generation ago. And now it's very much embedded in their mind what not to do. Now, five generations from now or three generations from now, will they flip? Quite possibly. Chile has been promoted as largely a bastion of freedom. From my personal experience in reading statistics, I don't find Chile to be quite... Uh, everything it's made out to be at least. Nothing wrong with Chile. I'm not opposed to you going and living there. I've proposed it to folks occasionally. But to say that Chile is, is free, in my opinion, as it once was, uh, is probably false. I certainly am not the, the foremost expert on that subject, but they have, in my opinion, probably become too successful to where now they're gonna start becoming detached from what got them back there. Uh, and so, yeah, you know what? You might have to move around every once in a while. I hate to tell you. You might have to be diversified, yeah. It might be a little inconvenient. Do you know what's inconvenient? Having all your stuff taken because you left 100% of it in one country where you're from because I don't want to go where three people got beaten in a restaurant. Honestly. You're welcome to stay behind. And I really have no issue with the fact that 99.9% .9 of people want to stay living in their home country. It's comfortable. They like it. Their mom's there. Their grandma's there. Just say that. The fact that you're here arguing with me, someone who has been pretty successful doing this, diversified all around the world, living what I consider a pretty free life, much more than I ever felt in the, in the US, feel much more comfortable. I had people who have met me, uh, you know, they knew me 10 years ago, they meet me now, they say, you're much calmer. Um, that's the result. And I see that result with a lot of people that I, that I speak with and that I help and that I watch. And if you don't want to be in that camp, I'm not angry with you. But I think there needs to be a time when you say to yourself, well, then I'm going to go watch something else. Go watch some music video. I don't, do whatever people do. I, you know, why do you want to you know, look at the idea of diversifying when you're going to find fault with everything else? Um, my philosophy is if you believe everything sucks, it, have three choices. At least you can pick the one that sucks the least. Or maybe you get lucky. Let's just put it in the paradigm of, Everything's falling apart. Okay, have three passports, have three residences, be able to move between the three and see if you don't feel more free. If they all, if they all fall apart, if 200 plus countries and territories all fall apart, then I guess you're totally screwed. But wouldn't you rather have three times the choices? And heck, if they're gonna take everything you own anyway, wouldn't you at least rather use some of the money that they're gonna take anyway to buy some extra you know, protection, to move some money overseas, to put gold in a vault, to get a second passport, to buy a house somewhere else? Wouldn't you at least rather make it tougher for them? It's a lot easier if you live in the US to push one button and everything you have in the bank is frozen. It's a lot easier to push one button and it goes to the court and they end up taking your house. It's harder when you're diversified. And I'm not saying to use this as a way to hide from the man. We are, as you, as you know, the goody two shoes of the offshore industry. And I believe people should play by the rules, which is partially why I think you should be able to opt out of the system that you're in when things get bad enough. But I think a lot of you are so focused on how do I just sit here and complain? And that's fine. And I understand that any audience attracts its own contingent of whiners and complainers and defeatists and people who never get anything done. That's fine. We can still be friends. But to keep doing this and say that there's no hope, I'm out here in the real world. I'm traveling all around. There is hope. The world was never perfect. But number one, you need to stop paying attention to the media, which sensationalizes everything in every other country that's going wrong in an effort to keep you there. That's kind of the whole basis of what we're talking about here. Uh, but also, 
realize that there are places that are better, not only statistically, but from a personal, I just feel more free perspective. That I can promise you. If you come out and join me, I believe you'll see it as well. And if you don't see it, then I guess at least you explored something, you can cross it off your list. How can Nomad Capitalist help you? Four ways. Number one, subscribe to our channel and click the notification bell to make sure you get our new video every day. Number two, get a copy of Nomad Capitalist, the book. You'll learn a lot of my personal experiences over a dozen years of studying this stuff, as well as exactly some of the strategies that you can use to build your Nomad Capitalist plan. Number three, if you're not sure where to start, but you want to come and learn from my team and I, you want to come and mingle with like-minded people, learn more about our live conference, Nomad Capitalist Live. It's coming up soon. And number four, if you want some help right now because you've got a burning issue, you need something solved, you want to lower your taxes, get a second passport, or build the Nomad Capitalist lifestyle of your dreams, go to nomadcapitalist.com and click on Become a Client.